Okay, so just to clear it up, since we're in awards season, of the two big important movies from iconic directors with the word killer in the title, this is the one that's a lot longer, is about things other than being a metaphor of itself and its director, and that you should probably try to see in theaters, because while they were both chiefly made for a streaming service, Killers of the Flower Moon is on the one you probably don't have. Anyway, the story here is a historical American crime drama from Martin Scorsese about the methodical mass murder and robbery for oil wealth from Osage Nation in the early 20th century, often overlooked by historians and previously dramatized mainly as the opening act of stories about the origin of the FBI. The meta story, however, one that's nearly impossible to divorce from the coverage of the film itself, is that while Scorsese initially set out to tell that version of the story once again, as in beginning near the end of the actual criminality, where the agents of the newly formed Federal Bureau swept into the scene, dug around a bit, recognized, holy shit, there is a shockingly obvious, barely even covered up, massive crime conspiracy happening here that no one has done shit about because of local corruption and systemic racism, thus serving as the proof of concept for the necessity of a federal police investigation force. Apparently, he and star producer Leonardo DiCaprio, during some downtime from the COVID pandemic, delays, with DiCaprio initially set to play the lead FBI agent as main hero, became convinced that centering external protagonists rather than the Osage victims as the main characters and framing a law enforcement hero narrative instead of a systemic corruption story just wasn't really the proper way to do a story like that anymore, ultimately leading the project to be reworked, with DiCaprio instead playing one of the main villains and accounting of the conspiracy misdeeds visited on the Osage people as the main story, trading roles with Jesse Plemons as the head of an FBI team who doesn't appear until the end of Act 3 to deliver something like accountability only after it's effectively all but too late. Robert De Niro is the main heavy orchestrating the evil, and Lily Gladstone is an Osage woman named Molly whom DiCaprio marries as his entrance into the scene, our audience sympathy character, and audience POV character for a lot of the story, but maybe not for enough of it? Since they don't really teach this history in schools, the relevant background here is that by almost comically cruel trick of fate, the Osage Nation had been forced onto what appeared to be the most arid and unusable land available during the organized displacement and genocide of indigenous Americans, only to discover that their worthless land was in fact full of oil, making them incredibly wealthy, but also effectively ruled over by lawmen and benefactors like De Niro's William King Hale, the Osage were victimized with suspicious murder, suspicious maladies, medical malpractice, and stuff that just happened, up to and included being married off to conspiring interlopers like DiCaprio's Ernest Burkhardt, whom Molly knows is mainly marrying her for her money, but mainly seems to grok too late how far involved he actually is in for the rest of it, possibly because he only appears to intermittently be cognizant of it himself, which is more or less where this one kind of slips up to the degree that a movie this well-intentioned and also this good could be said to do so. I mean, let me be clear on it, even suggesting for the Martin Scorsese doesn't generally make bad movies curve, where even when I just don't like something he puts out, like say, Silence, didn't care for it, kinda bored the shit out of me if I'm being honest, or like I still think Gangs in New York is kinda all over the place, I have to concede, still better than a lot of other people's best, you know? Like, he's Martin fucking Scorsese for a reason, but even on that curvature where you list off the other movies he's done and it's like Goodfellas, Taxi Driver, Color of Money, Casino, Age of Innocence, Kundun, Wolf of Wall Street, Raging Bull, Last Temptation of Christ, Cape Fear, The Departed, and people start in no fucking way, those were all the same guy, holy fuck and shit. Hugo too. I remember that. This one, still damn good, and an it's as good as it looks and sounds on Paperway, that rare scenario where you can look at a premise and pedigree and say, damn, that's gonna be a good movie, and you're basically right. But if there is a but to this one, it's that I'm not sure DiCaprio works in it quite as well as it needs him to. It's definitely a game effort, kudos to recognizing where the story should have been going and jumping in with both feet on playing not just the baddie, but a gross, ignorant, irredeemable shithead baddie, instead of the kind of cocky, you wanna like me, but you don't baddie, Scorsese prefers to cast him as. Ernest is a bad guy who's also bad at being a bad guy, and a coward, and incapable of growth or development or self-account on top of it, which makes him interesting as a character in a classic banality of evil way on analysis, but maybe not totally compelling as a central figure, which he basically is for a bunch of the story. Not that either this director or actor are in unfamiliar territory following villains as a narrative driver, but the combination of alternating between too stupid to grasp his actions and too evil to care about it once he does is a tough ask in terms of following a character for the length of a feature, and while an easy fix to that seemingly presents itself in the case of just make Molly the POV, the circumstance for actual storyline is in just not being present for a lot of the key plot scenes, and not knowing but suspecting what's happening being a key plot point make that difficult. It's a conundrum I'm not sure you can solve without making a completely different film from a wholly other perspective set in the same historical space, so within that context the film represents an exceptional effort to wrestle consciously with history and its own imperfect ability to convey the same, right down to a bizarre but eventually powerful ending sequence where, without giving it away, the filmmaker himself comes about as close as any director has when presented with such material to saying, look, we did our best, we still probably didn't really do justice to what happened here, but how could could we? And what that ends up meaning is that the villains have an air of almost cartoonishly over-the-top, are you kidding me, out in the open bad guyness, despite the fact that no, this really did happen, while the Osage characters, and in particular Gladstone as Molly, are afforded a deliberate, natural, realist presentation that further places them into the audience sympathy seat as more relatable and real than the antagonist, a bold approach that pays off particularly as Gladstone is able to stand out even opposite DiCaprio and De Niro in their showier look how bad we are bad guy roles. It's a tough, unforgiving part in a very unhappy and dark film, and a real testament to her considerable star power that she shines through 
you all the same. This will be the first time many audiences will have had a chance to see her, and it is a standout way to be introduced. The fact is, no one movie or number of movies can ever really do justice to the tragedy presented here, and that so few have even attempted to tell any of the story this one can only try mightily to tell a few parts of is part of the tragedy it seeks to depict. What's in evidence on screen is a big scope, intimately scaled horror story of greed and evil versus resilience, spectacularly acted and grandly directed, easily one of the best and most emotionally affecting films of the year, and absolutely worth checking out. 9 out of 10, don't miss it.